You're awesome. Thanks so much for coming back so quickly. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Welcome back. You know, I realized that I never properly introduced myself. I think everybody in the room knows that I'm Laurie Baskin. I'm Director of Research Policy and Collective Action at Theater Communications Group. And we are going to get started with the afternoon portion of our day um, serving education staff at TCG member theaters. Um, we are going to turn the podium over to Sean Cottrell, a Senior Vice President and Human Services Practice Group Leader at Starkweather and Shepley Insurance Brokerage. Um, and Matthew Reber, partner with Pannon, Lopes, Devereaux, and Ogara. Did I get all that right, gentlemen? Please correct me when you come on up here. Um, assuming you want the podium. Uh, or you want to do it. We were going to go back and forth together, so uh, we stand or... You, if you're in his new podium, you can slip that in and not hold it. Okay. Otherwise, uh, awesome. yeah, do whatever works. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. You want to sit down? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Lori, for having us. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. Obviously, the topic today and what you've been talking about throughout the morning and into your afternoon session is a sensitive one and a very important one to the business that you're in. Uh, as Lori mentioned, I'm in the insurance business. I'm a risk manager, and I specialize in insuring theater organizations across the country, and that's why I'm here to talk to you today. And, and Matt, uh, is an employment attorney that also specializes in this field. And we wanted to talk to you about the best practices and risk management around uh, increased youth involvement in your organizations. So from our standpoint, you know, this is a really tough topic. Uh, it's sensitive. Uh, it's, it's very tough to talk about. And Matt and I will probably talk in some certainty, but this isn't a certain topic. So, so what we say, there, there may be gray areas, there may be things that you disagree with us on. So just, you know, this is more just for your uh, information purposes. So what we wanted to really talk to you about today is give you a brief overview of why we're talking about this from a liability perspective. How this can affect your organization's uh, future, how it can affect individuals, and, and most importantly, how it can affect the youth that are uh, participating in, in your programs or your theater groups. So Matt is going to kind of go from there on the liability end. Sure. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Lori. As Sean said, I, I'm an attorney. This is my 14th year practicing law. I'm an 06 graduate of Tulane University School of Law in New Orleans. I primarily practice in the Northeast. I'm licensed Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York. My entire career has been spent defending organizations, large and small, from claims against them uh, for harassment, discrimination, but I've also had claims where I've defended schools and other organizations uh, with regard to allegations that teachers or um, uh, providers to children have acted inappropriately, inappropriately with those children. Here's the other thing that I've done, and I think why it's uh, uniquely um, specific to this presentation. I actually prosecuted a claim against a religious organization uh, that had, uh, our, our position, defraud, defrauded an elderly woman of approximately $35 million. So I know this from both sides. I've defended claims, I've prosecuted claims. Why is this discussion so important right now? What you're seeing in the law, and the law is an imperfect thing, but it frequently will track sort of what the general population wants. Sort of the popular ideas have a way of filtering into the law. And with this issue specifically right now, there's been an analysis and a manner in which claims alleging physical abuse against a child have been, um, or, or, or someone under the age of 18, a minor, have been addressed. And I think uniformly, the legal community has heard from the public and the, the manner that this has been addressed has been rejected. Um, these claims, as was, were discussed earlier, there's issues of trauma, there's issues of memory, there's issues of not wanting to speak about what happened, and that leads to these claims being brought years and years after the events supporting the claims you know, occurred. From, from, the, from the law's standpoint, we don't like that. We like fast and somewhat expeditious resolution of claims. Why? Memory, physical evidence, all of that deteriorates with time. 
So what we've done is we've had these bright line rules and they've been applied to these cases and I think the results ultimately have been looked at by outsiders and said, this is not correct, we need to address it. So what is happening now is state legislatures and where Sean and I live back in New England specifically um, and other states, but mostly New England, have expanded what's called the statute of limitations. Again, that rule that we, the attorneys, the judges, came up with to say this claim has to be brought within a specific period of time because, you know, again, for, for whatever reason, you know, um, those rules are being expanded. So, for instance, Rhode Island right now, the statute of limitations is going to be 35 years um, from the time that the alleged act occurred. So if you think of that, you could have someone right now who's 18 years old and within 30 years that person could bring a claim, that claim would be timely. Um, and again, the reason the policy for those changes is I think it's tracking popular uh, public belief that the former bright line rules were inequitable, unjust. And that's fine. And that change is occurring. From the standpoint of liability and having a, a frank discussion about how do we as organizations look at this and say, you know, what, what, is, what is this change? How is this going to affect us? Um, because again, in 30 years, where are you going to be? If you're an executive director now, what steps are you taking to protect your organization decades from now from a potential claim? Um, and so what Sean and I are gonna do are talk about some, again, real basic rules that I think you could look at today, incorporate into what you're doing, um, and again, protect yourself eventually from, from liability. So Matt just gave you, uh, the, from the insurance side, from the lawyer side, why we're really concerned about this from a liability perspective from the organization standpoint. We didn't want to spend too much time there, but you, we wanted to outline that for you so you understand where we're coming from and where the organization should be really coming from, from a support standpoint to the folks in this room. So whether you are the executive director or you're the edu education coordinator for your individual theater, you know, it's really our responsibilities to make sure that the folks that are in our care custody control, uh, especially these youth uh, folks that can be in our programs, we're doing the right thing and we have buy-in all the way up to the executive director, to the board of directors, on sound risk management practices. So where I kind of wanted to go with this is just kind of give you a kind of rundown of uh, sexual harassment, of youth abuse harassment prevention program that I'm seeing that's best in class in the industry. So it's kind of a rundown, but the biggest thing that I think is the biggest takeaway to talk about is we need support from the organization's senior leadership. If you don't have buy-in on these risk management procedures, they're, they're not gonna be successful, and you will, unfortunately, from the statistics that I've seen and the claims that I've seen without getting into any detail, you will have the serious claim. So that's number one for us. Uh, the, the second thing, and I think on Matt's list, probably the most important thing is documentation. These youth programs that you have, are you documenting the hiring process? Are you documenting the background checks that they're supposed to get? Are you documenting um, any situations that are outside the scope of that individual's employment? The training that you're going into, what training are you offering your staff for dealing with youth individuals? Does anyone, uh, I guess show of hands, do we have a program out there for training individuals that are dealing with children in our theaters? How, I guess, how recent has that been updated? Are you constantly working on that? Is that a revolving document? Where, where are you getting your information, I guess, is, is kind of where I'm going with it. You know, who are you talking to? Are you talking to the attorneys? Are you talking to the risk management providers? Um, uh, just a comment I'll make is that uh, the carriers that you're using from an insurance perspective offer a lot of great tools and trainings that you may be able to take advantage of free of cost. Well, it's not really free of cost, but in reality, it's included in the premium that you're paying to the insurance carriers. There's a lot of great uh, I would call it uh, accurate, timely information that's available that's potentially plug and play into these current programs that you just, a lot of you raised your hand to, to say you had. And also, the systems that they have in place allow you to have someone log in. 
uh, identify themselves and, and, and send back a note to the person running the program to say they have taken this abuse and molestation training course. So again, kind of tying in all these, these together, you know, from a documentation standpoint, not only doing the training, but documenting it. And Matt, I don't know if you had any yeah. comments along those lines. Sure. Um, so generally, the general rule for retention of an employee's file is three years uh, after the date of termination. That's sort of the general best practice. It, EEOC says, you know, at least you have to retain it for one year. The Fair Labor Standards Act says you have to obtain, re retain payroll records for three years. So here's what I would say to you if, in your, if you're providing services to, to, to children, to minors, um, and you're in one of these states which is now adopting an expansive approach to the statute of limitations with these claims, I may consider holding on to those fire files for a long, longer period of time. And again, uh, if you look to Massachusetts, Rhode Island, where we are with those statute of limitations, you're talking decades after um, an event could have occurred. Claims become completely indefensible when uh, you go and look for documents and there's nothing there. So I think that what this is going to do and place upon you as employers is increase your uh, record retention um, beyond sort of what has been the best practice. So that's one. The other thing I would say is, you know, to the, to the extent you're using subcontractors, that if we're subcontracting any of this work out, there's a real um, leniency with regards to record retention and subcontractors. It, it, you know, I'm sure if I were to get one of your files with regards to a subcontract, it would have that. To the extent you have a subcontractor who's working with, 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 with people under the age of 18, um, you need more. You know, you need to make sure that they have complied with the training, that they have an understanding of what the organization's goals are with regards to interaction between someone who is going to be working on the organization's behalf and someone who's under the age of 18. You want to document that. And, and I think that is something, especially with the gig economy, with the increased use of subcontractors, that's something that I think employers generally are not thinking about. They, they just think, I have the subcontract, I'm fine. Uh, no, I think, you know, from the perspective of defeating claims of liability, you need more. Um, you need more than that. You need to do your due diligence. Um, the other thing Sean said about record retention, the thing that as an employer that you can do with regards to record retention is to have an employee file that is organized, that breaks this all out. We've gone through pre-screening uh, when we're hiring the candidate. We've trained them, we've documented that, and we have a file that looks like something if there ever is a later brought claim. Pre-screening of employees, from my perspective in this issue, is where you, would, you can prevent them. Um, the key, obviously, is prevention. You never want to have one of these claims. Pre-screening, to me, is crucial, and I think the thing that you have to do, especially with employees who are working with people under the age of 18, is to ensure that you call, that you've, you, you've, you've got the references, you've checked them. I, I'll give you an example. My wife and I have a three-year-old son. We had a part-time nanny that we found through care.com. She was excellent. The first candidate, we were this close to hiring her, and I said, let's call the, the two people on the reference list. Second person said, I would never leave a six-month-old with this woman ever. And that was that, you know, and, and that amount of diligence is what you have to do with these employees. You have to take those steps because you never know what they're going to say. And you can rely on it. You can rely on that information in reaching a decision. And again, and then it goes into an employee file that says pre-screening was completed. We called a list of references and here's what was stated. And all of that ultimately, when you're looking at someone bringing a claim against you and saying you knew or should have known that this person was going to be a, a poor employee, well, we didn't have notice through the pre-screening process. Here's the results. So, so a lot of you did raise your hand and said we did have an abuse prevention policy in place. I guess I want to ask another question. Does that policy account for one-on-one -on -one meetings? Because we have a different kind of workspace we're, we're different types of organizations. We're not going into offices maybe every day to, to, in, to interact with folks. But is there a policy within your program that's going to address one-on-one -on -one situations, after-hour situations? You know, th those are the things you really want to look into your policies to determine that that is in there. Because the claims that we are seeing, the preventable claims that Matt had talked about, um, are coming from those types of scenarios. 
and really focusing in on the policy itself is really going to be important for you. Um, the other thing that I think we see a lot of times from the standpoint of organizations kind of falling down on abuse prevention training is line level managers or individual employees should have a voice. And if anyone alleges an uh, incident take place, what, what I'm seeing and have seen in the past is those incidents go, oh, that's, that can't be true, that didn't happen, that person's a, gr a great individual, it, it can't be true. Those situations obviously can't happen anymore, and, and really empowering those line level managers to, to come to the senior management to voice a complaint or concern is so important. I know a lot of organizations have put in hotlines where it's anonymous, where you can send an email or you can leave a voicemail message and, and leave your specific concern anony anonymously. And that's been pretty successful from what I've seen. Um, Matt touched upon the, the third parties, your, your vendors that you may be working with to, to, to partner with. I think I saw something in the program earlier that you're trying to interact more with other youth organizations kind of bring them into the fold and what you're doing at your individual theaters. Th those situations are great, but I think Matt put up a great point. What contractual obligations have you set up with those organizations? Because there may be something going on at that location with one of their employees that now may transfer over to your organization because they may, that other employee may be at your center and something could have happened there and you might not have done a background check on that employee because it's not your employee. So making sure that those contractual obligations spell out responsibility to that third party is huge for your organization. So again, you know, we're, we're trying to give you some takeaways to go back to your, your individual theaters on, and I guess there's a five-step program that I subscribe to, and it starts with awareness training, skillful screening uh, process. Again, Matt touched upon that. I mean, really focusing in on hiring, and understanding who you're bringing in. And if there is a red flag, you need to chase it down and determine if it is something or it isn't something. And you just can't say, well, they, they're a good person. I'm, you know, Matt with his child said, well, this is a really great hire. I'm just gonna do it. No, I better check that reference. And when he did, he found um, an issue. Uh, the, the third thing, policies and procedures. Again, how recently have you updated them? Um, how, who and, who is involved with updating them, and is senior management involved with that process, not just HR or education. Um, again, I make mention of the resources that are available to you through the insurance companies that you're already insured by. Background checks, I don't know, again, uh, each state has different requirements on background checks, but what I'm starting to see is everyone going to the national check. Uh, when you're dealing with certain organizations and children, I believe you have to use background check checks that are on a national basis. But again, uh, where I'm seeing the insurance companies go on this is they're requiring national background checks. And then, you know, we could have all the best policies and procedures in the world in place, but if we don't monitor and, uh, and provide oversight on these policies, uh, they won't work. So those are my five kind of uh, part system to a, a safe harassment uh, abuse prevention system. Matt, I don't know if you had anything else. Yeah, we have about five minutes left. You know, for smaller organizations that don't have dedicated HR, I can tell you um, the worst claims I've ever had to handle are smaller organizations that don't have dedicated HR, right? Um, <laughs> you know, so, so what do we do if that's us? Um, one, talk to your stakeholders. I, I'm an attorney, I'm on a board of a very small day center that provides care to, to individuals with MS. It's great. I do some outsourced HR in a very limited role. Um, but that's fine, you know, that is helpful to them in me giving them some base guidance, meaning these are best practices. No different from what I'm doing with you today. I think that's permissible. So understand who your stakeholders are, your board members, and say, can they give me some advice? Here's what I would say to that, though. The other sort of worst claims that I've ever seen um, with regards specifically to, to, to small organizations and specifically nonprofits the overactive board member. Um, that can be very, very difficult. And so, again, everything Sean said, if you, if, you, if you can go through your insurance company and you don't have a dedicated HR person, but you have an executive director, um, 
you know, a chief executive officer, a, you know, a, a accounts receivable person, whoever it is, the business manager performing human resources, make sure that they get some training. Find out how you can do that, get them the training. So that's one. And, and, and again, know who your stakeholders are, see if they can contribute, but don't let them drive the bus. And in one of the worst claims I've ever defended, I had an executive director who was essentially at the whim of the board chair, and um, it was a termination of probably the most popular teacher at the school. And what ended up happening is the, the, the teacher needed to be fired, unquestionably, but then the, the executive director and the board chair are going back and forth. Board chair was, I don't want you to do this. And there's email correspondence to that point. It made the organization struggle with the defense of that claim. So one of the things as executive directors I think you need to do is if you have that board chair and you reach a decision to terminate an employee and they're second guessing, the discussion with the board chair is you second guessing my decision, if there's ever someone else coming back to look at this decision, is going to create a problem for us because that's really the basis of all liability for employment, harassment, any of it is somebody else says this is a bad call and at the time there's a dispute internally, is this a bad call? It makes the decision seem to be challengeable then, later, and at all times. Um, so again, know your stakeholders, find the resources you can get if you don't have dedicated HR, and then secondly, if you ever have someone on the board who's outside of the chain of command try to tell you this is what your job is, say no, um, I'm the executive director. Last thing, again, frontline supervisors, which Sean said, gotta have, them, gotta have them train, gotta document the training, gotta do it every year. Frontline supervisors are crucial. They're the ones who are going to see the seasonal employee who's come in to work the theater camp, text the 16-year-old student at the theater camp and say, don't do that. You're not going to do that, you know? So you have to have frontline supervisors understand what improper conduct is, train them, and then empower them to say to you, this happened. Um, so that's, those are my final three points, and, and thank you for your time today. and I don't have something good to say about them, I've been told to not say anything. But in this Me Too age, where what we're finding is that people, abusers, were using that to their advantage, and knowing that we work with young people, has there been any movement on um, an, a, a former employee's, uh, employer's ability to let somebody know what they're in for, or how would you, like, what could, what could we do in those scenarios? Sorry, Here, here's the concern from the attorney's standpoint. If you called me and said, um, you know, we have a former manager and now another theater wants to hire them, this was the worst manager I've ever had and I want to say that. The, the concern that you have or I would have is if this person is litigious, they can sue you. They can say this is defamation. They can say this is a false claim or a false statement and then they can bring a claim against you. And from the liability standpoint, that turns into something where you, you know, what you, when you say the truth, that's not defamation. When you give opinion about a former employee because you feel that um, you have a public, like a public obligation, like a, 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 a duty to tell the third party, that's not defamation, that's privileged. The problem is, is to show that, you have to hire me, you know, we have to go through documents, depositions, emails, now, so, so here's my advice. Generally, I think the advice you get is completely correct that because the risk of potential litigation, um, you should not say something about a former employee if there's an inquiry. If it's about abuse of someone who's under the age of 18, if it's about sexual harassment, um, and the person was terminated for those issues, you know, you know, and there's not a settlement agreement, you may have an obligation, especially with someone under the age of 18, um, you actually may have a legal requirement to disclose that information depending on which state you're in. Um, 
And so here's the last piece of advice I would say to you on that is, what does your file look like, right? If you have an employee file that when I see it as the lawyer defending you, I look at it and say, we've got everything we need here, I think you can be more likely to respond to those inquiries. Um, if you have an employee file and you open it up and there's no written discipline, there's no progressive discipline, there's no training, there's no policies, that's gonna be something where you know it turns into a he said, she said about the person's performance and that can be a case where you might have a claim. My, I agree with you 100% obviously. Um, my only comment is for years and years and years the reason this thing went on because we would just fire them. Sorry, please leave. And they went, as you said, went on to the next place, the next place, the next place. But um, what I'm seeing more and more of is um, agencies taking more responsibility and really following up with law enforcement when appropriate. Because a lot of these situations that we're dealing with do need to go to law enforcement. And in fact, I was going to ask Matt, sometimes we're mandatory reporters on some of these situations. Depending on your state. Depending on the state. So, you know, really following through with the proper law enforcement is really probably from my standpoint would, would help me sleep well at night, where in the past I think we've all been trained and society has trained us to, basically we fired them, not our problem anymore. Really following things through on these items are really important. So that's really my takeaway um, at the time of these incidents. I think we had a question in the back. <coughs> So I don't want to open up a can of worms or anything, but um, I don't know if, I think I call it compassionate condonement. Sometimes you don't let people go, uh, employees or volunteers, because fill in the reason, you know, they're older, they're, um, they've had the job for a really long time, whatever that is. And I, I think I'm trying to, as a new employee, seeing all of this stuff happen, um, there's a risk management training that we can provide to the volunteers, but if you have a base of thousands of volunteers, how do we navigate that? And um, on top of that, how do we navigate not supporting the employees who call the whistleblower hotline and um, report information that just sits, sits there in a file and doesn't really get acted upon? Um, it's, hard, it's hard to create these risk management presentations, but there's no follow through. And I guess that's, I, I don't know if you know where I'm going with this question. I absolutely do know where you're going. Um, to your first part of your question, management of these risk management programs. So basically uh, documenting each person's individual file to show that they've taken some uh, abuse or some sort of anti-harassment type training um, was a lot harder before. The insurance companies, we use Philadelphia Insurance Company, we'll use uh, Great American Insurance Company as examples, which a lot of your organizations are probably insured with offer an online platform that basically when you hire these folks, they get assigned a username and login. They have to, as part of their pre-employment, go on this system and fill out this form and, and take the class. And that automatically will go to your HR, whoever's handling that situation, and document the file. So it's gotten a lot easier to actually do these trainings and make sure even when we're a larger organization with thousands of employees, we can get it done. But your question, the second question, I think I'll, I'll throw it over to Matt, but actually having a policy, having a whistleblower hotline, and then getting the whistleblower action or getting a violation of that policy, and then doing nothing, I'll just say from a liability perspective with the coverage itself, those are the scariest claims that I get in because I don't know if we're buying enough insurance limits for the potential damages that we're going to have to pay out because we are 100% negligent, I guess, am I saying that right, Matt? Potentially. Yeah. Let, me, let me just, one, one, final, <laughs> one final point on your first question. Here's what I like to do. Um, I like to go into rooms like this for my clients and meet with the frontline supervisors and the managers and the executive director sits in the back and sort of is like, this is my day where I get to have a cup of coffee and relax because the lawyer is going to come in and, and, and give it straight. And that's what we do. Um, again, who are your stakeholders? If you have outside counsel, if you have a, a, you know, a, a board member who says, you know, I, my colleague is an employment attorney, bring them in. Because a lot of these messages, I think, don't get said because they're hard messages, you know? Compliance, reporting, you know, you need to say if someone you're working with has done something inappropriate, speak up, speak up. Um, People don't like to say that because, again, there's this notion that it's putting additional burdens on the employees. It's going to stress the employees out. 
Compliance is something that you have to do, and if the message is sent from you through training, you bring in outsiders, they speak to the employees, you document it, you show it occurred. Again, that to me is always you can sort of eliminate liability. If you get a call on the whistleblowing hotline, you, you have an obligation um, generally to follow up on that. What does that mean? Now, you may have something where you spend a half hour on it and you realize that the employee, the person who called, that it's completely baseless. That's fine, okay? That's fine. You can reach that conclusion. Um, the key is, is that if anyone ever comes back and says what was done with regards to this complaint, there's a documented record of we looked at it, we spoke to people, we have an understanding of what occurred, we don't think it was a violation of our policies, or it was a minor violation of our policies and we merited out some progressive discipline, or it was a significant violation of our policy and we terminated the employee. All of that is sort of what you have to do. Um, if you don't do that, to Sean's point, if the whistleblower actually reports something that um, was going on in your company, now, in, then you're on notice of it. And again, you're on actual notice of it. They called, they said this is there. So defenses to these claims of abuse, what employers generally do, because you know, they're, they're brought in as a third party, you say, well, we didn't understand that this was going on. If there is a voicemail on your hotline, you have notice. Um, so you have to do something. From the standpoint of the actual reporting procedures on your insurance policy to make sure that if we do get a claim in and it, it potentially could be something that we have to pay out some damages on, if we don't report that in a timely fashion because we are on notice, as Matt said, that's, that's we're being put on notice, we potentially may lose out on any insurance coverage that we would have had the right to because we didn't do our due diligence and put the carrier on notice. Any other questions? This is Lori. I think I'm going to... Burning, Rachel? Go ahead. One more. Last question. I think mine's kind of um, kind of dry, but I would love to get... Um, no, it's okay. I'd love to get your take on it, which is the liability associated with having an at-will contract. Because I've certainly experienced that and had a lot of fear, or I've noticed a lot of fear on um, board members or... Um, uh, some of our, our pro bono um, legal advice in terms of what are the steps to go through if, say, we uh, want to dismiss someone, but, it, but it, it's a piece that doesn't quite compute in my head if we have signed an at-will agreement, and so I feel like I need a little bit more information. So I would appreciate which, it. Which state are you in? Uh, Illinois. Okay. Um, so let me... And previously California. Okay. So, so, so here's the basis of at-will, and I, I don't know the rule in Illinois. The basis of at will is you can fire for any reason or no reason at all, right? Um, and so putting that into a contract, it's not a contract, right? At will employment is not, is, is, it's like, it's, it's an arrangement, but, it, but like, it's a contractual relationship, but a contract for employment is something that is a definite term, right? You will be here for a year, um, and it has, terms like that, so a third party looking at it could say, okay, I understand that the theater director is here from September 1st, 2019 to September 1st, 2020, and at that time, the contract is subject to renewal. At-will employees generally have what's called an offer letter, which does not contain a definite term of employment. That's what you have to avoid. So it can't say from September 1 to September 1 then the person is a contractual employee and they have to be fired for just cause. That's point one. Point two, be careful about including terms in an offer letter that could be construed as a specific and definite period of time. I had that case and I lost that case. It was a, <laughs> it was a school and they said, your employment at the school is at will. On the top of the at-will offer letter, it says this letter covers the 2009-2010 academic year, which by way of reference ran from a specific date to a specific date. So a judge looking at that said, that is a definite term. We have an ambiguous contract because it says at-will and there's a term the employee had to be fired for just cause. So again, words like contract, it's an offer letter. Um, 
what are we making sure we're not putting in the offer letter? Anything that a third party looking at it could construe as a definite period of time. That's great. So thank you all very much for the opportunity for Matt and thank I to you. come up and speak thank with you, you today. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll be around the rest of the actual conference uh, and the rest of the day if you have any questions you want to talk to us. You'll be here? We'll be here. Did you say great? Yep. Thank you. I think this is, um, this is super helpful not just for the organization but everybody in the building. Young people, staff, everybody. It, it's really important information. Thank you. All right. Um, our next panel is being moderated by Kati Kerner from Lincoln Center Theater. And I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Kati and let you introduce your panel. Hello, so we will be getting up and moving back to the funky creative space in a, in a minute. But um, yeah, why don't we just do that first? That sounds like a good thing to do. Let's do that. And then we can introduce, we can have introductions, we can, let's do the, the moving part. back to the audience portion section. You don't need to bring all of your stuff. You could just leave your stuff. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I should have said that before. Okay, thanks for, thanks for getting up and, and moving into this other space. So, when we were talking about the, um, the various issues that we wanted to um, see in this education pre-conference, the issue of um, the safety of youth in our organizations came was a big, a big issue. And um, and as we started to break that down, um, it was clear that it was also a very complicated issue, involving you know how we work with students in classrooms, how students work with our larger interface with our larger organizations what constitutes um, harassment. I mean, there are so many different aspects to, to this issue. So it's our hope that, um, that this afternoon we will be able to examine this issue from some different sides. And um, to do that, we have a wonderful panel of, oh Jesus, of um, folks, and I'd like to introduce them. So Rachel Hull is the uh, Director of Education at Berkeley Rep. Um, Johami Morales is the education director at Seattle Children's Theater, and um, and Nikki Toombs is the education director at True Colors Theater. Kenny, Le the official name is Kenny Leone's True Colors Theater Company. Yes, and I feel like I'm sitting in a very here. Sorry, sorry, the microphone is just doing terrible things. So I'm just going to put this here right now. Hopefully, it will stop doing terrible things. Okay, so um, so we wanted to um, not just we've spent a lot of time today absorbing a lot of very important and also very difficult and heavy information that is I know is sitting in my body as well as in my mind. Um, so. What we'd like to do is to, um, to start thinking about it with our 
bodies as well as with our minds as we um, sit at the end of the day. So to do that, I am going to pass the microphone to Nikki. Hey, all. So we're going to stand up very quickly. OK, if you're, if you're anything like me, you just need a little bit of a stretch. If you could just like, stretch your hands out. And just rest in it just for about 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and slowly bring them to your side. All right, that was selfishly driven, just so you know that. <laughs> All right, so when Toronto Burke would do her interviews regarding the Me Too movement. We know that's the founder of the Me Too movement. Um, she was often asked, she said, what do, you, what, what, they, what do you feel knowing that your movement has created a voice for women? What, what, what does that feel like to you? And her retort would be, her retort was, I don't believe that this movement was about women being heard. I believe it was about the powers that be actually listening and doing actions about it. And that was what the major difference was. So one of the things that we're hoping that we will generate in our conversation is that we will get to the point where we start reflecting on our practices so that we will be those powers that be in some instances to figure out that we not only listen, but that we are setting up actions so that we can change that dynamic. Now we know that art imitates life and what we've been seeing more regularly is that some of these horrible things that are associated with our world are seeping into our theaters. And sometimes we're just putting it in a little box and saying, oh, that's just the culture. Or, oh, that's just what we do. But, oh, that's just not acceptable. So one of the things that we want to do is create this open dialogue and safe and brave space so we can start unpacking some of those things and realize what we do. So this, for this activity, this is what I need you to do. Your instructions are, I'm going to say or list a declarative statement or situation or scenario. If you believe that this is an example of harassment, you will turn your back. Simple as that. Clear? If you do not feel as if it is an instance of harassment, then you'll stay forward. Now, one of the challenges that we're having, I think, in some cases, and, I, and I'll be the first to admit that I've been guilty of it as well, is sometimes understanding beyond the denotative meaning of what harassment is, understanding the connotative meaning of what it is, because some things that we have accepted as the norm are not, they're quite abnormal. So, we're just going to try to see if you can determine whether this is or is not an example of harassment, clear on the expectation? Okay, let me get my little cheat sheet over here. Are you ready? So, in this first example, several actors are telling sexually suggestive jokes. Two actors in the space acknowledge, hey, I'm not so cool with those jokes that have a little sexual innuendo. Is this, or is this not, an example of harassment? turn back. Now let me say this, and this is the one thing that I omitted to say. Please do not feel pressure to turn just because you see others turn. I also see some of you guys that did kind of a profile left or profile right <laughs> because you were in that decision purgatory of like, well, it depends, you know, who's telling the joke. And in some instances, that may be your truth. And if that is your truth, stand in it. Clear? Second scenario. It's the holidays. Merry Christmas, babe. It's what they say, right? We got Christmas trees all over the space. There's a Christmas party slated for the staff, the interns, and even the, contract the contractors. So we have Christmas decorations all over the space, and we have had some that have said, hey, I don't celebrate Christmas. No ho, ho, ho for me. Is this, or is this not an example of harassment? Please turn. And all these. It's, 
And, 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 and I think in all of these situations, th those variables make, make sense. But in this particular instance, it was literally just said, hey, you know, I don't believe in Christmas. And it was like, oh, it's okay. Well, you don't have to participate, but you still have the decorations in the, in the space. So we, we're clear, decorations are still there. Celebration is still going on. You don't have to participate, but it's still up. Okay, turn back to me. So you and your interns have this sweet paternal, maternal type of relationship and you go over to your little sweet baby and you pat them on their back. Oh, great job today dealing with development. Is this or is this not an example of harassment? That's all I can give you. Oh, I love the struggle. <laughs> Turn back to me, we're on our last two. So the use of colloquialism such as, yes, honey, get your life, love. Um, hey, girlfriend, hi, sister girl. Is this an example of harassment? Anyone in leadership, anyone that's there, your, your artistic director, your director of education, you're just saying this in a theater setting, and they're saying, oh, 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 I thought you said who's saying it. So you want me to do, you want me to do my yes again? Okay, here we go. So the, use, so the use of colloquialism such as, yes, get your life, what it do, boo, hey, sister girl, all of those things, are those examples of harassment? This is in your theatrical spaces, okay? Last one. The director often comments on how beautiful an actress is. Now they have a rapport with each other. <laughs> I think the only time I saw somebody turn that quickly, it was the Temptations or the Five Heartbeats. I have never seen a turn that quickly. So let me just do my formal thing. Is, is it or is it not an example of harassment? Okay, so everyone turn back to me. So what I will tell you all is each of these examples were actually legal cases. They were all issues of harassment, every last one of them, because what we have to be mindful of is not about your intent. It's the perception of the person that feels as if they have been offended. And we can't always approach things, approach things from the lens of, well, I didn't mean it, or it's just a joke, or, hey, well, she is beautiful. You understand? So one of the things that we wanted to make sure we understood is that we have multiple types of harassment and Johami's going to come and show you that we also have some handouts for you regarding yes. that. you may have your seats so, please so you guys can just uh, take a look at this handout so um uh, as we were having a little bit of, of some of these conversations uh, a little bit before we came out here um we started to ask a little bit more of the questions of like well what kinds of harassment what where's the line of, of when something becomes a harassment or not um, and so that's why we wanted to start a little bit with that. But we also wanted to just give you a little bit of just some references on as we start to get a little bit more into the discussion on the variety of types of um, harassments that could be happening at your workplace um, or that you could also partake in and not actually realize it because that is not your intention. But uh, at the end of the day, if that individual feels it that way uh, and impacts them in that way, um, there's just something for us to just be more aware. And so we just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of just different types of harassment to have a little bit more of a broader base of, of some of the conversations that we're going to have today. Um, and, um, and those entail uh, just discriminatory um, harassment, uh, pers personal harassment, physical harassment, power harassment, psychological harassment, online harassment, retaliation harassment, which was one actually that I didn't even think about, and I've actually experienced a lot of it, but I didn't think about it actually as, as an actual term. Um, sexual harassment, third party harassment, uh, and verbal harassment. And so these are just, um, just other, th other ways of us just really trying to expand ourselves a little bit more when we start thinking and talking about some of these um, issues and challenges in our theaters. 
Um, I think one of the things that's interesting also what we heard from our um, legal friends too is that it, these are different state by state. Um, and um, is for instance, in California, there's a lot of focus actually on the first one, on discriminatory. So when you do uh, anti-harassment training, there's a lot of focus around gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, and religion. So even packed in that first discriminatory one, there's a lot of room um, that we work in, both with our young people and with the people who work with our young people. Um, and though these are guidelines that are legally around employment, so around your employees and the workplace that you create for them, um, we know that our young people are affected by the culture we create and by the, the rules that are set around them, the expectations that are around them. So that's part of why we wanted to, to really open up the idea uh, beyond just having a conversation. I mean, when we talk about youth safety, we don't want to just talk about safety in terms of um, um, abuse or physical safety. We want to be able to talk about the variety of ways in which um, harassment can show up in an organization. Okay. Here she comes again. So um, please be mindful of your number. I won't go one, two, three, four, five. I may go. Four, five. Clear on the expectation? I'm going to divide you into groups of five. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Clear? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Clear? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Participating? Five. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One. Ones will be here. Twos will be here. Threes will be here. Fours there. And five here. Take your paper with you, please. Did I miss you? Oh, I thought you were calling me. So here we go. Here are your quick instructions. Now, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't determine whether I was a one or a three, just jump in a group. It's okay. Where are my ones? Where are my twos? Threes, fours, and fives. Beautiful. If, my, if these two groups can separate just a smidge, So very quickly, so Jahami gave you guys some very clear and detailed um, definitions for the different types of harassment. So what your task is within your groups, you will have approximately seven minutes to create a tableau. We understand that tableau is for French for picture. It's this, motion, this motionless image. And so what we're, I'm going to assign you a specific type of harassment and you're going to do, present or I'll give, we'll give you the choice if you would like to uh, present your tableau demonstrating what that definition looks like, okay? So I'm going to illustrate what it feels like, what it means, whatever's most comfortable for you. Ready? It's not fit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we just, and we don't want to necessarily go into a, a situation where someone's trying to show a, show a harassment because we don't know everybody's story in the room. I don't, I don't know you, you don't know all about me. But what we wanted to catch her was like an abstract feeling of what does this, what kind of feelings can this harassment, um, situations of harassment cause in us and then create a tableau around that as abstract as you'd like. But just to find a way to physicalize what our um, young people or employees might feel if these harassments take place. Is that okay? Is everybody clear on that? Yes, and, and or maybe so? Okay, here we go, group one. You have discriminatory harassment. Group two, you have power harassment. Group three, you have online harassment. Group four, you have retaliation announce, uh, announcement, harassment. And group five, you have third party harassment. Your time starts now.
You have four minutes, 17 seconds remaining. Three minutes, 22 seconds. One minute, 18 seconds. Thirty seconds.
All right, and we're ready. We're at places. Group one, where are you? Are you ready? All right. I think you had, did you have discriminatory? All right, we're ready. You can have someone give a one, two, three, and then tableau. One, two, three, tableau. Beautiful. Now we'd love to have someone explain what's happening. Volunteer? So our group in the middle, they are holding the power. I am the not seen, the one that is not seen. We have one here who is oppressed and pushed down. Um, and then we have one who is intimidated and pushed away. So we tried to represent how you can feel from a bunch of different vantage points. Because we came up, we started with talking about adjectives for how that person would feel, and we wanted to have representations of that around the power. Beautiful. Great job. <laughs> Group number two, were you power? All right. We can get a one, two, three tableau. All right, can we get a, a drummer jerk from this group to tell us what's going on? It's <laughs> okay, um, so we're basically in a circle because we're all isolated, so we're each portraying, like we're looking up because um, the power discrimination, so harassment, um, and so it's to represent that we're all working together, but we feel isolated and uh, we feel powerless. Um, I mean, we said a lot of things. Vulnerable, anxious, feeling like you're looking over your shoulder at all times because of the power dynamic. That's wonderful. <laughs> Group three, online harassment. All right, can we get someone to explain? Okay, <laughs> um, okay online harassment. So we talked about um, uh, it being isolating um, and then all of the people around um, is sort of like at the same time that you feel isolated, um, there's also the whole world it feels like is is watching you or looking at you, um, and the am yes, right. Let, let people have the courage to do these mean things because you don't really know who they are. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Group four retaliation. Can we have someone explain? Yes, I, I put it here. 
Um, we had a lot of uh, words that we use like prevention, stoppage, um, unawareness. Sometimes you're not realizing that you're um, discriminating against somebody or harassing somebody. So she felt trapped in her, in her own world. He was preventing her from it. And here we are unaware of it, having our own glee and fun, blissfully ignorant of the situation. Um, and so it's still happening, and we might not be contributing to it directly, but indirectly we were. Oh, wow. Great job. Great job. And group five, third party harassment. All right, can we have someone explain? So we talked about um, a feeling of isolation or powerlessness and kind of fear and uncertainty of uh, being maybe unaware what consequences could come to someone who is outside of your own organization, like not knowing the chain of command or what might happen to someone who's outside of your organization, how that could make the victim feel especially um, powerless. Very nice work. Awesome. So the hope, of course, is that when we know we grow, and so we weren't applauding, you know, the, 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 uh, we were applauding the great effort yeah. that you put in your tableau. Okay, so um, we wanted to get a sense of, now we've got a sense of now sort of what the different types of harassment, sort of a, a definition of terms, um, and what that might, those each might potentially mean to, to us, sort of thinking some of those through. Now we wanted to just sort of um, get a sense of who's in the room. Um, so uh, can I pass the baton to you? Yeah, so our, our plan for the next step is to kind of talk through some of the policies and then some of the trainings or procedures we've put in place and then um, it kind of end in a place of like, what do we feel, what, what's missing from that work? Like, what, where is it not enough? But before we got there, before we started preaching about all the things we've done, um, we, we also wanted to see where other people were at too. So um, if you don't mind, if we can just do a couple of hand raises. Um, can you raise your hand if you are an organization that works primarily with youth in creating their own work? So youth theaters who um, work with youth in creating their own, perfect, fantastic, great, wonderful. And then can you raise your hand if you work for a children's theater or an organization that is creating work for young people to come and um, be a part of? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, can you raise your hand if you are a primarily presenting organization um, or cultural center um, in that way? Great, thank you. And then if you um, consider yourself like a regional theater who does producing work um, and has an, ed has an education arm, as it were. <laughs> Ooh, hi, friends. Fantastic. Um, and then just a couple of quick, just to see where people are at. How many people have an in-house HR person? Uh, how many people have an in-house? Oh. Great, so let's do it real quick layers. How many people um, um, are privileged enough to have an in-house person whose specialty is HR, and that's what they do? Great. How many people have a person who HR is part of their duties? Okay, how many people have an HR consultant? but not necessarily a dedicated person. Okay, and then um, how many people have an HR friend? Okay. Yep, true story. Um, how many people have created some sort of youth engagement policy or standards of conduct for how your employees will engage with young people? Okay, and, and sorry, I was supposed to ask this before. How many of your companies have an anti-harassment policy for their company in their company handbook. Some gold stars, okay. Great, yeah. Okay, so um, what I think we'd like to do right now because of the, um, the camera is transition back to our audience style seats and then we'll, okay. 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 or we could just scooch back. All right. 
sorry, we just want to, want to be mindful of the, the people for whom seeing the back of our heads is probably not that engaging. Um, so uh, if you need to get your writing stuff, if you want to, I mean, I just, we, we promised you the opportunity to write and now we are reneging on that promise. So. Sorry for the back and forth, but at this point of the day, we're, we're embracing every opportunity to, to move. So um, what I'd like to do now is to um, give my colleagues an opportunity to talk a little bit about how each of their organizations has approached, approached this issue. What kind of, and first, um, I think that, that it's important to kind of consider um, uh, anti-harassment policies sort of in two categories. One is um, the, the policies that are in place for teaching artists who are in a classroom with young people, and that is really the extent of their work. Then there's sort of a second category, which is um, how young people interface and engage with the rest of our organizations. So whether as interns um, or in, in some, uh, as young performers, um, in some other capacity. So perhaps what we could do, what I'd like to do first is to have each of you address um, the training and policies and procedures that you have in place for your, internally to your education department. Um, Johami, do you wanna take that first? Yeah. Uh, so I, um, uh, hi, I'm Johami Morales and I'm the Director of Education at Seattle Children's Theater. And, uh, and we actually, I mean, we have a, a variety of different practices and, and policies that we uh, set um, as we have different young people coming through the space. Uh, we have different programming happening in the summer versus the school year. Uh, and then we also have programming where we go out and do outreach in different classrooms. Um, I, um, I will be very, very honest, uh, I just started this job about four months ago, so I'm, I'm learning a lot about the organization right now and where we are. Um, some of the foundational practices that we have, and then also um, it's actually been a really exciting time, I think, for me and, and some of my colleagues to be able to work together on really going back to some of these policies that we have and really reflect and ask ourselves questions. Is this the right policy? Do we need to enhance something? Do we need to shift something? Do we need to um, go out and reach out for other resources that might continue to enhance uh, our practices um, in the room? Um, and so. Um, I would say that right now, um, I'm very fortunate that I'm coming into to something that um, has a really strong foundation. And so now I think it, it's giving me the opportunity to um, expand in other areas, uh, such as like how do we empower our teaching artists um, to have a little bit more of resources and understanding as they're going into such different and dynamic classrooms uh, out into the schools and then versus uh, when we have teaching artists in our spaces, in our building, where we have a little bit more control of that environment and who comes in and who goes out. Um, and, so, and so those are places where we're looking at on, on how do we continue to empower um, our teaching artists and then have that communication back and forth so that they have those resources. And then also, uh, for right now example, um, next week we start our internship program and so we have an entire week of uh, orientation and policies and information that we go through with our teaching artists as they're gonna be joining us uh, as part of staff, but also interacting directly with a lot of our students in the summer. Um, and so those are just some of the, the practices that we, that we have um, uh, set in place. And then of course, as teaching artists come through our space, because we have different teaching artists coming throughout um, the year, then we bring them in into an orientation um, that we gear specifically in that time period, depending on what programming they're gonna be jumping into. Can I just ask how, before we pass it, so how long is that orientation and do you have um, teaching artists sign something or what's, what are the nuts and bolts of that? 
Yeah, um, we have, um, so we have, we usually do about two hour um, time. Uh, we're teaching artists, um, we're just going through the highlights of our manual. And then, um, and then we talk a lot about expectation and, um, and then of course that after they have looked at all the information for them to sign and saying that they have read and signed the guidelines and policies um, that are expected. Um, we do have, um, we have a, a staff manual that we have for, for everyone, and then we have an additional, which the teaching artists also do have the, the staff um, manual, but they also, we also have a, a teaching artist manual that's specifically more about classroom and things that they're directly doing in the classroom, because um, not all our staff members are doing the same kind of work, so yeah. Nikki Toombs, Kenny Leon, True Colors Theater Company, title is Director of Education. The things that we do for our teaching artists, first they are required to do professional development. They have approximately 25 hours of required professional development time, both with us, the managing director. Um, we also have teachers come in and provide input as far as in what are their asks and what are they desiring in their instructional settings. Um, in our MOA, Memorandum of Agreement, we, have, we also have a affirmation statements that says, I understand that I am not to, i.e., drive a student this or do that. Um, we also have simulated activities. You know, I, I know all of us, most of us, well, I, I would assume, well, I won't assume. Well, I've gone to college. I just put it on me. And I know that sometimes what's always in my textbook is nothing like that real hands-on experience is what I'm trying to, to say. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll simulate those experiences or I'll, one of the teachers in our partnering schools, I'll say, hey, is it possible for me to allow my teaching artists to come out and if we can identify a group of students to come out and kind of let's just see what they're doing and how they're going. And it normally works for us. So especially for those new teaching artists to have a chance to see what it's like to have those warm bodies in this space. So typically, as I said, we have simulated related situations. We have everything outlined in our MOA. We have um, both paid and unpaid professional development that's required for all of our teaching artists. Um, we also have structured meetings where we come back and we do talkbacks to say, hey, what's, what's, what's our experiences as we're going into the schools and, and different situations. So that's typically what we do for our education department as far as in making sure that they understand the, ex the expectations when working with youth. Um, Rachel Hull, Berkeley Rep again. Um, so we, um, I'm very lucky to have gotten to follow after Rachel Fink, and um, who put in place a lot of policies that we when, we, when the theater company went back and renewed its handbook, we went back and renewed our policies as well. So we have a youth engagement policy that is very specific, and it's airs on the side of like, I will not spank, I will not hit. I mean, it is very specific. Um, because what we know um, about education, it, it, working with all people, is that when expectations are clear, it's easier for people to know what is expected, you know, what is expected of them. That doesn't make any sense, but you know what I mean. But expectations are, are fair. Um, giving expectations, clear expectations is, what is it, Brene Brown says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind, or something like that. Um, so we have a, anyone who works with young people, um, and that even includes our fellows, who are not employees, but they still... Um, sign a youth engagement policy that is very specific about what we expect that engagement to mean. And it's got both things we expect people to prohibit, so not do, but it also has things we expect people to amplify. So it, you know, I think these documents can become really scary about all the don'ts, which we need in there for legal purposes, but ours also has a tone of what we want our culture to be as well. Um, and then all of our young, all of our youth engagement policy, I mean, all of our people who work with youth are background checked. Um, that's uh, part of uh, something we do in our company, but also because of our school partnerships, there are schools that require it. Um, some schools will require a, uh, um, a live scan, like a fingerprint scan. Um, we work that out with the school. Um, we do not pass that expense on to the teaching artist unless the teaching artist is teaching in multiple organizations that also require it. But if they're only doing that for our contract, we try to find a way to either cover it ourselves or have the school partner with us in covering it because it can be expensive. Um, the other thing is, is we've developed in just our general contract because actually we do a lot of adult classes. And recently we've discovered that safety on our campus is not just about young people. It's also about adults, it's about vulnerable adults, it's about um, our teachers and, and the safety of our teachers as well. 
Um, so, and that, don't even get me started on like earthquakes and active shooting and protests because we have all of those policies as well because Berkeley. But we, um, <clears throat> we have an extensive in our contract, so anyone who teaches with us, whether they teach with young people or um, um, adults, signs in our letter, our offer letter, which I will now be changing to not include dates. Um, it, it, it does include a, <laughs> woo, a pretty extensive um, communications policy, actually. So we have pretty rigorous steps around communicating with students, even adult students. So we ask our adult teachers to email through the company not to con connect with students directly. Um, and recently, the biggest training, and I will say the thing that kind of is new for us um, within the last three or four years is our teachers, you know, who are, have been teaching for a long time, and, and especially our teachers of adults who have been in used to work in college settings and, and also work for us and also direct all over our communities, they are the slowest adapters to working with um, um, our communities who have, um, who, are, who, who have different identities and are asking to be considered in the way they would like to be considered in this space. Um, so something is very simple, just to give you an example of, we had a, um, an adult class where a teacher um, a, a student came in and um, said, I would like to do a role that is in this gender. But the teacher said, but that's not your gender, which of course, first of all, I'm like, no, not for you to say. But second of all, um, it's a classroom. And these students are trying to explore their acting style and the things that they need to explore. And so instead of engaging in a conversation, that teaching artist got just really confused and really shut down. So we actually brought all of our adult teachers and then all of our youth teachers together and did a training recently um, that was around identity, um, that was around um, uh, how it, the legal ramifications of not paying attention to what people are telling you, which is a big part of it. Um, the legal ramifications of not letting go of wanting to call everybody baby, like whatever that thing is that like people are holding on to when we've told you repeatedly you need to stop, right? So we needed to like get into the scary part of what is the legal ramifications of this. And that was important, it was policy, it was the things that they sign. The other part was the philosophy of what are we trying to create in a culture for our students? So we actually had this really beautiful session with our teaching artists where one of our teaching artists offered up that they were challenged and it happened to be this teacher. I didn't even prompt them. And they offered up that they were challenged because of the situation where a student wanted to play a gender that the teaching artist did not identify as their own gender and um, was really digging in their heels and not in a mean way but in a, um, a philosophical way about, um, about there needing to be two different physical genders to be able to express the emotion that was happening in the scene. And we just kept lovingly digging into why, like what are you trying to get at? What behavior or attributes are you trying to get at? And by the end of like an hour and a half productive conversation with our full teaching staff, not even with us as um, you know, their supervisors or boss, they had gotten to a place of like, right, I'm looking for this behavior not this physical identity, which was a huge movement for this person who, up until that point, we thought we were going to have to let go because they were not changing the way they would look at the situation. So for us, there are, there are actual um, pieces of paper which I brought and left in my hotel room, but if you would like a copy of our youth engagement policy, I am happy to share. Two o'clock tomorrow, I will be with the teenagers. Come find me, or I'll be at the bar. So you just, either way. But the other piece I really want to say is like, for me, the thing I've been playing with is this expectations piece um, and how am I very clear with them about what they can be held liable because they are employees too and they can be held liable for their actions. And then what are the pieces that's like, legally, I can't bring you to task for not letting someone play this role, although give California time. But I am gonna say, um, California is passing legislature um, about pronouns right now that I'm very excited about. But I am going to say on the other side, philosophy-wise, I can't say that word philosophically, on this side, we're going to set a culture. And if you don't adhere to that culture, um, and we want you to challenge it and tell us why you're struggling against it, but that's the culture we're going for. And if that's not the right culture for you, you need to find another organization to be a part of because this is where we're headed. So that balance is something I think we're really playing with. Thank you. So um, let's just, I'd like to turn the discussion briefly to um, engaging, the education department engaging with the larger organization. 
And then we'd like to have um, some time to open uh, to your questions. And I think if, um, if you can talk a little bit about sort of what um, policies and procedures you have in place for to, to train your colleagues who don't work in education, um, and then maybe sort of a, a, a question or a, a time when that made you challenge or revise those, those policies. Gosh, this is in my hand. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. So, permission to be transparent. Um, honestly, at True Colors, this is where you press pause. Um, <laughs> so, I have a job next week. Um, so, so, honestly. <laughs> um, Sorry, Nikki, I have to say, do you, do you genuinely want them to press no, pause? No, 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 no. No. <laughs> No, honestly, what I want, but, but you know, I mean, as Kenny says, we, our, our true colors comes from seeking truth and clarity. So right now I'm going to clear up the fact that I have to tell the truth that there were certain practices that I don't think. Oh, so here's the thing. Because I or the education department works, worked directly with students, the rest of the staff was somewhat limited to a certain degree as far as in their interaction with students. So of course, when you were assigned a specific internship, marketing or management or dramaturgy or whatever else it is, you were dealing with students in that regard. Um, one of the things that I'm, one of the reasons I'm so hands on in those situations is because sometimes when others are doing their duties, I don't want the, ba I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still at old school, the babies. I didn't want the babies to fall and not have a true learning experience because you had to go and do this or you had to go do that. So I still wanted to make sure that instruction was moving forward. So in my particular instance, the education department is really, really almost exclusively hands on. So the, 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 the limitation or shall I say, um, the degree of involvement was us having a staff um, orientation and say he, these are the expectations, this is how we interact. We have to understand that some of the things that we do or say in our culture when others are not around, it's just not permissible, even though we should say this shouldn't be permissible, but realistically, you know, sometimes you may hear a few expletives here or there, or may hear a little energy or whatever the situation may be. So that was the degree um, of their level of involvement. So we had one particular inc um, incident where there was um, a student who wanted to um, be a part of the process, be at the table and be in rehearsals and things. And so a particular uh, contracted employee um, grabbed the student, you know, and in, 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 in this particular situation, when they grabbed them, and I don't want, I'm, not, I'm not making excuses or justifying, please understand this. So when they were saying something, the person was just pretty much grabbing their hands just to say, hey, hold on, you know, because we're talking and we're doing whatever. It wasn't like, don't you talk. But the person interpreted it as if you violated my space, you touched me, you humiliated me, you made me feel as if I was, you know, not worthy and all of these things. So then, it, you know, we have an um, internship liaison. So the individual reported it to her. And then, of course, she reported it to me. And so we were trying to set up, you know, what, what were our next steps? Well, as we were trying to investigate and figure out what exactly happened, what was the situation, the young, uh, the individual had, had written this letter that said that he or she deserved to be respected and they I mean it was this long litany of this of all of these things of these infractions and you don't have the right to do this and it kind of handcuffed us because we weren't able to make the next step because it was kind of like they withdrew from the from the program and you know there were some people that said oh well Johami just for example Johami didn't mean that that's just the way she speaks that's just the way she interacts and things. And it made us have to go back as a company and look back and say, no, we cannot accept this as the norm and say that this is just how they act, so that's okay. So that's when we had to go back and start saying, okay, we have to at least start having a conversation, not just with us as a staff, but with the, those people that we're contracting out to say, hey, you can't touch these babies. You can't talk to them in this particular way. This is inappropriate and you are not reflecting what our core values are at our institution. So to, to conclude, I will say that we are working on doing a better process as far as in having norms set in place to say this is what we do, but honestly, because education works so directly and the rest of the department is limited, I cannot honestly say that what we do is this is our first step and second step, but we are making steps toward it, making it better, so we don't have to have any instances like that again. 
Um, for I, I would say I think I'm I'm very lucky because I, I think it becomes a little bit easier I think for for me because the institution is a is a children's theater uh, as opposed to working within a department you know of a of a repertory theater or or in, or any other type of of professional theater company so so I think the the culture that's already ingrained in working in a TYA company you know facilitates it for me in a way that it's kind of a part of what everybody in that building so everybody is has a background check so everybody's already indoctrinated into that culture um, I know that when I was working at Creed Repertory Theater, which is uh, a very unique uh, community because it's a very small town, it's a mountain town, and so bringing in students into that culture, into the theater, was just part of their life. I mean, they grow up really being um, a part of the theater, and not necessarily everybody, uh, like the professional actors, were necessarily background check, only if they were working directly with students. So that's where I, I've felt like there were places uh, where I really had to be more hands-on in individual students' experiences to making sure that it was myself and maybe another two teaching artists were part of that learning experience for that student. And then also making sure that we, are, that we were bringing a lot of those policies a lot more specific to the actors and the professional um, uh, production staff as well that maybe didn't interact with the students all the time and so making sure that we reminded that they were mentors and they were leaders in the community and if parents and students were around um, they were they were a reflection of the theater so really trying to shift that culture in a way that everybody is a part of that learning that one individual learning ex learning experience for that kid um, has been something that I've just automatically now, I, I don't think about it, I just do it, and it's part of, of what, I, what I end up doing. And so I would say that at, at SCT, it, it becomes a lot easier because everybody is on the same ship, going in the same direction, because we are there to serve children. Um, and so we, we have, it's a little more unique, I think, for, for us. Yeah, I think for us, it's, um, there are moments where we do really well at this, and then there are moments where it's challenging. And one of the things I've had to really, or not had to, but one of the, one of the places we wrestle, and we wrestle as a company around it, is at, though we want young people to be um, empowered to be in multiple spaces, there are also some spaces that I can't always promise it's the right space for them. And so I have to be clear about what are the expectations I have if we are going to have young people in that space? And if the, if the space can't support those expectations, I either gotta go back and plan and, and bring those expectations in, or I, in some instances, I have to let that space exist without those young people. Um, so for instance, very simple, we do a one-act festival, and we have a set and props construction, um, or set and props designers, but our young people don't use power tools. And it's a very real like liability, they're not allowed to use the power tools. Um, and there have been moments where what we've done is, um, with a little bit of training, we've allowed them to use like certain instruments, um, with documented training, but then there are also moments where our, we really have to examine like how much of them using that power tool is going to take them further in what they're supposed to be doing, which is designing, right? Um, but you could extrapolate that into a bunch of other areas too. There, we are a regional theater. I am not a children's theater, and um, and there are some discussions that need to be able to exist where they need to exist, and not have. And and I can't always promise that that's gonna work for my young people. Those haven't come up very often because um, also our young people are um, very opinionated and um, yet yeah, unique. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. The, the second thing I wanted to say is um, um, uh, just a very quick note about how casting um, is becoming a way that's actually bringing um, education practice into some of the artistic conversations. So California is starting to pass a law where um, minors will have to go through anti-harassment training, possibly with their parents. Um, this is something that um, is starting to come through and affect some of our cast members. Um, I have no information on this other than the Old Globe is looking into it, and I, as soon as I know more, email me, we'll find out. But um, it's this real question of, right, what does it mean to have a 16-year-old work on our campus if they're an employee, how are they being held to the same standards? Which just goes back to how I think it's important that you're, whatever you create needs to match what the institution is creating as well. 
But then the third one is to say that part of this conversation came out of last year. We had a teen who came with us to Teen Council who spoke up at the Me Too movement about an experience at a theater. And, and because I know this teenager, I knew it wasn't at our theater because we talk about every, like, a lot of stuff. But we had to figure out who that theater was. It was another theater in our community, and she's an 18-year-old, an adult in um, the eyes of our world, and had interned at a company. And it was that a wake-up moment for me of... Um, two things, how do I um, make sure that the organizations around us have the same information that we have, right? I know that we speak from a place of privilege because we are a large institution who has a general manager who tracks down these employment laws. Um, so how are we making sure that other people in our community know? And, um, and what am I sharing with my young people about how they look for safe situations when they move outside of our walls? Um, we called in that organization and had a conversation with them about what policies and practices they had in place, of which they had none. And then we said to them very clearly, until you put them in place, we will not recommend our students to participate in your programs in any way, shape, or form. And, you need to, and we'll be explicit about that, because you are not one of my employees, and so I can say what I need to say, um, to a certain degree, obviously. Um, they have changed a lot of their policies now and put other things in place, but I do think there is a part of this that is community both within your organization, but community in our region, too. Um, so um, that was the other thing I wanted to just kind of name in the space and bring back. So what I'd like to do now is open, uh, open this to questions um, up to the, to the group, um, you know, if there are situations, anyway, questions, questions, you've got them. Um, my question, you, you talked about these two different categories of harassment, but I wonder if any of you have policies uh, when young people are harassing each other. I mean, I, um, we, if, if there is a situation happening in a classroom, I mean, I think, I think it's really uh, making sure that the teacher has ownership of the situation. Um, uh, I'm really trying to build a culture in my department in a way that, um, that the teaching artists and my staff feel comfortable enough to come and talk to me. Um, and so I would say that I think one of the things, I mean, we had a, a situation actually when I first started uh, where a student, um, was being disrespectful um, and there was a little bit of um, I would say the student very young actually very like I don't know what seven eight years old uh, student was being very disruptive disrespectful to not only the peers but um, but also the teachers or the um, administration that would come in to um, interact with students like during lunchtime and things like that and so um, I I think there was a little bit of a, of a power dynamic for me because I felt, well, like it's important for us to really address this for the student. And so I ended up bringing in the, the student in and, uh, and tried to have a conversation with the, with the dad because we, we ended up calling home and saying, look, this is a situation and uh, I think we're at a point where I think the student is not being productive and therefore the students in that classroom are not also being productive, so, so we, we need to send him home. And, um, and unfortunately, I wish that actually would have resulted into a better situation. Um, it just seemed like the parent was not in a place where it was ready to have that conversation of that particular student's behavior. Um, but I'm, I, I would say that a lot of the, the, the culture that I'm trying to ingrain in there is just really being able to give people the benefit of the doubt and then allowing students or adults being able to actually be in a room and have a conversation. Because um, I, I feel that a lot of the situations that we are in today, unfortunately, is because we don't, we're not making room for dialogue and conversation, and we're not making room for people to have mis make mistakes. Um, uh, but also, to a certain extent, we have to make a decision, and so I, we had to send this kid home. Um, and we haven't heard back. So yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, when parents are involved, it's, it, then it's their responsibility, of course. For us, most of our education programming is aligned with the schools, so it pretty much parallels the school's expectations. Um, for me, typically when I go into an instructional setting, I outline my expectations from the very beginning. Hey, I believe in reciprocity of respect. I give it, I expect it, da, 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 da. So I've been fortunate in most instances that I have not had any issues with, you know, 
dis disrespectful behavior and the, yeah. So most of the times we were able to combat those issues because the expectations were outlined from the very beginning with the teachers as well, but most of our guidelines parallel with the school since we're mostly in the school system. Um, we actually, we, so we have a student agreement that we also do um, for kids that we have for longer periods of time. So if it's like a six week class where we only see them every Monday, we don't do a student agreement, although I'm now thinking about it. But like in our summer program where we're with each other a lot, um, we have an agreement so that then when things happen, we can go back with both of them to that agreement and be like, does it match these expectations? But the other thing is, is that based on a school um, that I was in recently that went through, um, I got pulled in as a teaching artist into a restorative justice circle. And um, I find that this practice, especially for some of our students, who um, a big part of res that, that restorative justice at their level within that um, uh, middle school was about being heard. and. Um, and it was, a, it was a process that worked really well, especially for middle school. And so um, we've kind of unofficially started doing some of that. So for instance, we had a, a, a situation come up with a kid who, was, who had differing abilities um, um, and was you know, on the spectrum. And, um, a, and another student um, who they didn't understand why they, what the discussion of pronouns was, our student with the differing abilities. And, um, and so, and it rose to a head more quickly than we could actually pull them apart and be like, let's break this down. So we did pull both of their parents and them into the room, partly also because for the kid who was on the spectrum, the parent needed to know the process whereby we were going. That's messy for us, because some of our kids, they don't have strong parent um, support. And so we, um, this is where we've been deciding a philosophy more than a policy. Um, because for some kids, it's important for us to let the parent know what happened. For other kids, it's important for us to respect their privacy. And what we're, we're trying to figure out legally, actually, we're talking to our attorneys right now, what that line is, especially when students share with us, because um, we do, we work with teenagers. And so when they share with us information that makes us nervous, we are not mandatory reporters. We have not been through California mandatory reporting training. Um, you have to be in a school setting to do that. Uh, but you don't have to be, but that's where it starts. But we are community volunteer reporters. And so where does the line come up um, is a big question for us. And when it gets into teenagers and their own sexual identity and how that plays out with their activity and their own and their parents, that's something we're exploring and it's living more in philosophy than policy for us right now, if that helps at all. Yeah. Evelyn, can I ask you to pass just pass the um, sure. the microphone down to Faye? Who's that a question? Oh. Uh, speaking about um, uh, behavior um, in growing interpersonal and personal skills. Do you have any policies in place specifically around, or anyone in, in the room, around physical touch and intervention around conflict resolution? So like when fights break out, like what do you, how do you advise your teachers um, with that? And for us, that can sometimes be like a, you know, it can happen more often than not. Does somebody in the group wanna address that? So, so we have a very specific policy and we train everybody how to do it. First of all, because most of our students work in a, most of our teachers work in a specific school system, we follow the rule of that school system, which is a no touch policy. So especially around fights, and this is the hardest thing because especially you got two kindergarten students, you're like, I could stop this if I just went like that, but you can't. So we have a, a verbal prompt that you have to do. We practice it. We, you know, th this is what you do. If you can't stop it with a verbal prompt, then you need to, you know, call the security because there's only certain people within the school district who are actually trained to touch the students. Uh, and if that, and you, you know, you also have to clear the perimeter and make sure that other kids aren't being harmed and so forth. So there, there's a lot that, that we do and I can fill you in more, but it is very, very specific. Um, and it's, it's hard, and sometimes a teacher will come back uh, on Thursday and go, I did it. I, I got in the middle, and <laughs> we're like, no, you can't do it. Yeah, exactly. And, so we ha and then we do the training again and, and remind people again. Yeah. Did somebody else have a question or want to say something, add something? Just to also go off what she said, 
being right in the school system, I thought when, when we were being taught no touch, no touch, no touch, um, the teachers, there was a fight in a classroom and some of the teachers ran out and because they couldn't stop the fight. And I remember the teacher saying, because my instinct was the te one of the kids ran to me because we were the safe class. So they ran in and I closed the door and tried to keep them in there. And then the teacher said, oh, no, you better move. And I said, they're going to destroy each other. And I said, at least I can keep them in the classroom. No, you better move. Don't touch them because the parents will come in. And I had two kindergartners break into a fight. And I had a parent tell me, you let my child um, get scratched. And of course, they're kindergarten, so it happens faster than you can even like blink your eyes. But I felt like, you know, awful. And my principal came to my defense and said, if we touch your child, she gets, she gets in trouble, you know? And so it's really, really a catch-22. But your instinct, your, your, cause the time I had to do something was I had a fifth grader who just was um, one of the kids who doesn't say anything and it's to themselves and just, you know, but you know they're going through quite a lot and I knew some of the things, but they were really quiet and someone pulled the chair just as a joke and he was, you know, when he would sit down and hit the floor and he just got up and started choking someone and just wouldn't let go. And I can't wait till security gets up there. So, you know, it was a bad situation. I was like, I don't know, I came and I told him myself, I was like, I pulled his hands off of him. What do I, do I get fired? Like, I didn't know what to do. But um, yeah, the rules are really specific. on policy just even without fights so you are not allowed to touch a child even on the shoulder unless you ask permission first and of course the child has to grant it back and we actually do that with student matinees too so we had a, a play just this past year where the audience um, and the actors came and they danced together and so forth and for the student matinee we had to go in and ask the actors you, you can't do that because you, you can't within the way the show works ask permission and so forth. Jenny, did you or did somebody else have a question? No hugs. I'm interested to know if anyone is working in youth theater settings where you may have, um, for instance, alumni returning who might be college age, working with teenagers who are not considered adults in our uh, by our standards, and um, any kind of intimacy training that might be happening if they're working on a production, and just any experiences in, in that vein. I would love to hear from Yo Johami, maybe. Um, I mean, um, I, I had a lot of those situations in, in when I was at Creed Rep, um, just because of the summer happens, and then those same students that were in the summer uh, programming that would come back. Um, but when, I mean, as soon as they're 18, I mean, they, they have to go through the same um, procedures and background check and all of that. Um, so, so that was just kind of like, we just did what we would normally do in terms of policies. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean we've, we've had that. Um, we've had that, and, and even right now at SCT, I mean, I think that's one of the things that Courtney is shifting a lot. We're, we're now incorporating a lot of um, uh, the kid actors in the community into our actual main stage productions. So, um, so a lot of that, there's a lot, well one, I think what has been helpful is that the, the number of cast is smaller. So then the, the ensemble that's working on that particular production becomes a more intimate experience for those actors, professional actors and the kid actors. Um, but I think for us right now, the way it works is just that it, we just we have the time to actually nurture that, those processes and bring those kids along. Um, and, and our actors have to go through the same training already and, and do our background check and all that. So all of that is just already embedded. And, and I think, I mean, it just goes back to like, I've, we, it's already in the culture for us. So it, it makes it so much easier, which, but I also understand that when you're working in an institution where you are a department within the bigger institution, it's challenging to try to figure out where that balance is. And, 
And what I would say for those of you that are in that situation is just really continuing to be present in spaces, making yourself you know, being out there, interacting with all of those, the acting company and things like that, so that your face is present and in the minds of the company as education and that kids are in our spaces at all times. The, the only other thing I would say is that there are, um, um, when I, so in uh, part of, I, in, when I was in Dallas, um, at Dallas Theater Center, we, I, we did a major child and vulnerable adults safety policy um, part, for two reasons, partly because we were doing a safety committee, but also because we were doing Joseph in the summer and we, they wanted 40 kids on stage. And up until that point, we had just lived by actors' equity rules, which, you know, if you have kids on stage, you have to have a child, what they called Wrangler, but which is basically a child advocate is what they're supposed to be. Is, is they're supposed to be the person who has been background checked and is, is just is operating in those spaces and looking out for their well-being. Um, but we knew that we wanted to go a step further when we had so many kids in our cast. And um, so we took um, what the children's theaters in town were doing, because they had some really great rules um, on page about um, what it meant when they went through a costume fitting and um, that their parents could have the opportunity to be present if they wanted, what it meant the first time they got a microphone put on them, and, and that that process was allowed to be um, something done with a parent um, and or walked through with a lot of verbal instruction. Um, and then we also met with all of the parents and went a step beyond what Actors' Equity requires in terms of information for them about what our youth engagement policies were as a company um, and what those expectations are. Some companies, I think, have even gone so far as to post on, on, their, on their website what their youth engagement policies are. And um, so I think if that's something, those are a couple of other places to go if you want specific language. Um, because the the unions have really struggled and the other one i would say is the screen actors guild um or whatever that that child version of that one they're doing a lot of work with this too i mean even so far as like when you have to i mean it started from the place of like tutors and stuff like that but they're getting into consent and intimacy stuff um because they have to so like hbo has done a lot of work around intimacy choreography but also um with young people because they're having to so um those are some resources i would take a look at Did you, you have the mic? Oh, yeah. yeah. And the, the other thing I just thought about, I mean, because we, we have a, a child wrangler, I guess they call them, and all of that. But um, the other thing, too, is that I'm, I'm, I would say that I'm in a process as well of really trying to figure out how do we engage our parents even more in those spaces and those conversations? Because I think what ends up happening is that then we as educators and institutions feel like we have responsibility, which we do, but then how do we also get our parents to be a part of those conversations? And, and even just thinking about like, how do we get parents to sign also like agreements with their kids that are gonna be participating in our programming? So that's just something that I just thought about right now. Could you pass the microphone down? Great, thank you. Um, so I work with teenagers, and um, I've worked for a few different organizations, and I'm really curious about, um, you talked about um, specifically youth engagement communications. Um, like some organizations that I've worked for will text or like use social media or email, and then some won't, and I really haven't seen a standard, at least for the places that I've worked, and so I'm really curious about that and like what why you built such policies and what it stems from. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, Rachel built them. I, we just kept working on them, so um, maybe Rachel can talk more about this. But um, for us, part of it is also because they work with fellows and because we have over hire, we have employees that are young, and we, we wanted to be really clear with our employees about what the expectation with them was around communication because those lines get gray. And the thing I've been thinking to myself now is, you know, we need to make these documents available to my young people so they know what the other people have been have signed mm -hmm. so that they could say back to me, hey, this thing happened. And I know that's against the policy, which I've never thought of doing until this moment. But we have a, um, a communication policy that basically we tell the teenagers unofficially, but um, we ask our employees to sign, which says that they will not engage on social media with any of our young people until they turn 18. Um, and um, they are, that we have, we use Remind app as a texting app. Mm -hmm. So um, an independent app to be able to communicate um, or we use email. Now teenagers are horrible with email, which yeah. is why we use the Remind app. Yeah. Um, 
And if someone is having a hard time contacting them, it goes through the program manager. So we, if, um, for instance, when they're working on that 1X festival, if the scenic construction fellow, who is oftentimes 22, is having a hard time getting hold of their 17-year-old teenager, we say, let us know, and we will find them for you, because that is our job. You may not go out independently, call them, set up a meeting with them, any of that stuff. And that's partly for protection of the teenager, because the teenager doesn't know all the rules around how to engage, but it's also for protection of our teaching artist. Um, and it just keeps clear lines, which, because uh, we, are we are a, a regional theater, that's that's part of our culture, is, is clear lines. Um, I, I, I think, your philosophy, there's no hard and fast rule on, on who can or cannot engage in social media. It, it's gotten way messier. I mean, there was a time when you couldn't have a social media account unless you were 13, and now people are finding their way around that. Um, so I think you have to pick the philosophy that works for your institution, um, that you feel comfortable around, and I think that's true of everything. You know, um, we struggled even in um, Dallas about should we, if we have 40 people on, 40 kids on stage, should all of the actors be background checked? But then it got into this real question with us about, so what if someone does have something in their past, but that's part of their past. They can't be in our show as long as we are putting other policies in place that protect the young people. Like, what does that mean? And for us as a company that was not a children's theater company, but that was a regional theater company, it asked some really hard questions of us. So I think in terms of communication, you gotta pick the policy that feels right to you. And if it ever feels wicky, you, you, you as an independent artist can pull back and be like, I don't feel comfortable communicating with them on my own devices. How do you want me to communicate with them? Because getting that clear expectation and putting that back on the organization as an independent artist is smart. I, I would do that. I put it on my boss and, and on Rachel Fink. But do you, do you want to say anything about? And then I have a question to add to as well. Um, well, first of all, those policies were created 10, 15 years ago, which is fascinating to me as I think about it. And part of it at that time was about being having extreme clarity that there should be no private interaction between an employee and a student, period, nonstop. So uh, that was one way of settling it. The other thing is also the employees are paid for their time when they're teaching. They are not paid for their time when they are communicating and an uncontrollable amount of emails back and forth with students. So there was another layer of it that was about having clear boundaries of um, the uh, teacher's time. So it, it was both. Um, but I'd like to throw a question uh, to you, certainly this group and then anyone else, uh, which is something that, it touches on something I've dealt with, which is uh, policies on third party harassment, such as donors or audience members, but really donors. So we are, um, for the first time this summer, doing anti-harassment training for all 1,000 of our volunteers. Um, and this came, actually we're doing anti-harassment and also implicit bias training, but it was one of those things where legally we needed to do anti-harassment training. And we knew because of the work we presented, we wanted to add implicit bias. Um, so I will say that for us, um, I can't speak to donors and I would love to know if anyone else in the room is thinking about that, although our development department has been talking about it. Um, but volunteers, um, for us, they also sign youth engagement policies and also in their kind of volunteer agreement, they sign the communication policy. There are things that they still sign. Um, I have questions about whether that has any legal holding because they're a volunteer, not an employee, and a lot of these harassment laws are around employees. But at least it gives me a place to be like, this is an expectation of you. Um, so, but I don't know if anyone has anything around donors. Anybody want to speak to donors? Anybody? Donors, interns, fellows? <laughs> then clearly something that we need to, yes, to think about. I just want to be mindful of time. Um, we have uh, about um, 27 more minutes allotted together. And, um, and so if there are still burning questions um, on this topic, we have, um, Lori's let me know that we have a little bit of time, a little flexibility to address those questions. I also want to honor 
the fact that this has been a day of a lot of stuff to think about. And I feel like, I feel like we need a moment just to sort of talk about how are we bringing whatever, what are the ideas that we're carrying away from today? And, um, and what do we want to know more about? And what are we, um, what are we inspired to re-examine and think about? So are there any burning questions about, um, before we move on, about um, the, um, the issues that we've just been discussing about safety of youth in our Yeah, no, you, you've been wanting to ask a question for a while. It might be like, it might be like, a, it might be like a segue to the larger question question. It's not even really a question so much as like attention. Um, not attention, but ah, uh, tension. Um, <laughs> thanks, folks. I'll be here all week. Um, so just in terms of like all of, uh, all of these policies that we need to have, and I heard like kind of the, the angst around like, how extreme the no touch policy is where you can't even break up a fight um, and, and can't be alone with a student, like paired with this knowledge that um, for a lot of especially um, young people without, you know, young people who have experienced a lot of trauma or young people without a lot of supportive systems in their life, like forming a trusting relationship with a single adult can be like the make or break factor for their success. And I, like the research supports that and my lived experience, you know, when I was in high school in the 90s, I probably spent more hours alone with my adult male physics teacher after school talking about, you know, talking about suicidality, talking about, you know, my sexual identity, like talking about all of these things that he would be so fired for now, you know, that would that would never have been able to happen, um, and and it just it kind of like breaks my heart to think that those boundaries that prevent students from maybe finding someone that they connect with, um, that they can trust, that will give them agency to be like hey, you know, like I'm having these thoughts or like I'm self-harming and that the adult doesn't immediately need to break the trust um, or like take away that student's power um, by saying, well, now I have to tell your parents or now I have to call um, an agency. Um, I have to report that. And yeah, I don't know. So that's just something that I wrestle with a lot. We wrestle with it a lot in in our company, like folks who are like, well, we have to protect ourselves, um, and we have to uh, serve serve the young people who are maybe most in need. So, thank. You. That was exactly the same thought I was having in this very moment, and you know, just to like about the research supporting, which is, it was, the irony is not lost on me that we talked about all of this trauma-informed practice, and, and also trauma, you know, victims of trauma are highly vulnerable, so they're, they're, they are more likely to get into situations in which um, they could potentially be harassed, abused, and at the same time, we do, there is a lot of research around relationships and trauma and how important they can be, and uh, we do have the, um, the unique situation of being having relationships with kids outside of the classroom at, in which they really trust us, like in programs that are after school or whatever. And it is a really tricky thing because transactional relationships can be traumatizing for students if they think that they're, oh, you only cared about me because you were being paid to do this job, right? So it's like we also have to be careful about going in and doing programs and walking away and never having another relationship with them again. There's no, I, there's not an answer. <laughs> no, and, and I'll, just, I'll just add to that. I mean, I think one of the really unique things that I found uh, working at Creed Rep was that there was a little bit more of space to have those relationships. Um, and as I was hearing you talk, Tamara, I just, it made me think a lot about just being able to 
it takes a lot more work, I think, for us today. And I think the work that we have to do in order to be able to build those relationships with students in that way and uniquely is to have to build those relationships with the parents and the guardians around. Um, because I know that the relationships that I build with a lot of those students, and even the students that I built relationships with at Interlochen that you know, were pretty much under our mentorship and under our wing during the school, they were there because it's a boarding school, it, there was a lot of that kind of relationship where we were building relationships with the student and those parents. And if those parents were the, maybe the parents that were around all the time, then it was a group of students that I was building relationships with. So I think the key, unfortunately, I think for us to be able to continue to build those relationships that are so important for, the, for their growing um, process at that time, and it's so pivotal, um, to their development is to just not be alone in a room, unfortunately. Um, and, and it's sad, um, I think, because there's something very beautiful about just human connection that way. But, but maybe what we should try to see the other side of it is like what's the possibility of being in a room with a group of students and how they can learn from each other and you can learn from each other just as much. Um, so, but I agree, it's, it's a hard time for us as educators. Somebody else want to share a, a thought or a question that they're leaving with or something that they, that they want to work on? As far away from the room as possible. <laughs> I have a couple thoughts here. I think that there's also an interesting, you know, I love the, you know, just the, the specificity that you've put in place as far as like using a Remind app when communicating with teens versus texting them directly. You know, but there's also a weird line when those teens become your employees. You know, because then they're actually my employee, right? Like, I need to actually communicate with them directly, and they need to be able to communicate with me if I'm off-site, and my cell phone is the only way that they could get in touch right now because I'm not at my desk 24-7. So there's also an interesting lines in, like, and then we don't have a policy right now that says you can't text, you know? So of, you know, and maybe that goes into that parental relationship and another permission slip or some sort of thing of, you know, Part of this relationship is gonna mean that you're gonna be texting directly with one of the, the education staff members. If it becomes inappropriate at all, here's how to report it, you know, and here's how this goes. You know, so I'm just I'm kind of curious about that as a as a way of how that gets incorporated into policy. Um, and then just from a logistical standpoint, just from these conversations, I feel like there were a lot of people that just raised their hands when the question was asked, how many have a policy? How many have a harassment policy? How many have this? And I know that you know those of us who have HR or our general managers or our managing directors or executive directors, whomever holds that role, you know, talk and share resources. But this clearly directly affects us as education directors. And much like TCG has that website for, for team and for the assessments, is there a shared place where we can be looking at models and examples of these policies so that we're not reinventing this language and going back to our theaters and saying we need to create this from scratch, but we can actually just read each other's and look, and if it makes more sense to take off your name and keep it anonymous, anonymous but just have those list of policies and procedures in place, I think that would be a really great platform. Laurie, did you, yeah. were you feeling the spirit? Thank you. Yeah, so um, TCG can support that. So I'm gonna ask, you all probably have my email address or I'll email you after this, but lbaskin at tcg.org. If you raise your hand and you have policies, procedures, and or trainings to go with the policies, that you're willing to share with, your, with the field, with your colleagues. I would be posting them. I'm not sure whether they'll get posted on the TCG website or the new um, platform, the TCG Circle, but one or the other um, will have to figure out the proper home. Um, honestly, if you're comfortable, I'd love for it to be attributed to you and your theater so that if people have questions, they know who to reach out to. Um, and I'd love for it to be a, a living, breathing thing. So, please send me resources. Um, you know, don't forget <laughs> when you get home, because if you're here through the week, you might forget. Maybe I'll email and remind next week. 
Um, but I think that would be a great next step. Um, that would be a sort of a tangible thing that um, we could all send home with you all. Um, are there other thoughts that, do you need to sort of decompress almost or process from the day, yeah? It's just a quick one. Um, do you have a policy uh, about uh, vaccination? Yeah, we do. <laughs> would, would, we can do. Can I just get a show of hands? We're currently developing. We're currently developing. Okay. And we're, we're also doing a Thanks. public, we're also doing a public vaccination program. Yeah. I actually started thinking about pets, and I don't know if, if anybody's uh, institution is pet friendly, but that's also another one that I was like, oh my God, we should be talking and thinking about that. So that's another policy that we're actually in the midst of, of finalizing as well. Yeah, let's, yeah. You should know that the managing director, general manager Google group, which is going to be moved over to the circle, asked this very question and they've all been emailing back and forth over the last two weeks about vaccination policies. Yeah. So it's a hot topic. We, yeah, we have, a, um, we have a vaccination policy um, on our campus as well as most of the schools we go into in the Bay Area, they require, um, they even require like a, a proof of um, that our teachers have been TB tested. So we have a pretty extensive one, which um, Rachel can tell you more about, but we also have a pet policy, um, and we also have started to develop, um, um, we had a teenager bring an emotional support um, rabbit to another theater. They were going to another theater to see something, but she had never brought this emotional support animal to our campus, nor brought any supporting. So we've had to now start asking some questions, but this is the thing I will say, which I was going to say to um, to um, Jenny's point is that there's a wormhole of policies. Like you can go, oh, like yeah. the packet of stuff that my, a, a, an employee, like a person who's doing a one hour sub, like they're subbing one hour, they still in my company have to sign like 35 documents. So I do think this question of what is right for your company, your culture is really important. And then getting with your HR attorney to just ask, okay, what is the requirement? And then, then beyond that, what is the philosophy I want to build? Um, and then what are the things I need to have written down and documented that's legal? But then what are the things that are about the trainings or cultures I want to set up are important because you can get lost in, in all the policies. And didn't the laws just change in California? Yes. And to what again, please? I, I don't remember exactly. It's. Um, it, there, there's, there's, it, it's something to the effect of like, there's only a certain plate, like there's only a certain point at which you can ask for documentation. Um, and there, are, in terms of employee, are you talking about? I thought that there was something recently about sexual harassment training or something. No, that, I said that, yeah, that right? anti-harassment training is anti being required for minors. For everybody, including um, like temp people who come, contractors and actors e and e everybody who comes in and through, even for discrete periods of time. Yeah, it's, un it's something like um, under 100 or 1,000, I can't remember which hours. If right. you work, I think it's 100. If you work 100 hours in a company, you have to undergo all of that training. Within the first 30 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it becomes quite a burden, um, but please do, in addition to all the reasons that we've been talking about, really keeping students and young people safe, keeping your teaching artists safe, taking care of you, your staff, the whole thing, um, uh, I think it's important to just pay attention to what the laws are in your state, that this stuff is so timely right now. Things are changing rapidly, and you need to check with your leadership and legal support. And you want to make sure there are things that you can monitor and support. I think that's another part, is you don't want to set up stuff that then you can't carry through on, which shows negligence. So I think you have to have a frank conversation with your team about what you can support and what you can't, you know. Unless somebody has some other sort of process, like, um, you know, you're dealing with and thinking about something from today, I actually want to spend just a couple of minutes looking forward. This stuff came out of last year um, and ongoing conversations in the field and in the world around us. Um, 
what's the next iteration of our conversation together? Are there topics? If you have anything on your mind, share it with me, please. And otherwise, please share with me after the conference. I think uh, teaching artists is something that um, I was talking to Faye earlier about, like just what are some of the structures that, that people have in their organizations when it comes to teaching artists. Uh, you know, like for us right now, we had to kind of bring all our teaching artists as employees, and so we're paying hourly as opposed to like a fee for a class or a directing gig or things like that. Yep. So just trying to f learn a little bit more about what other organizations are doing with their teaching artists and their structures, um, benefits for them, um, and also just how do we support our ecosystem of teaching artists because there's such a, a core part of our programming, but yet everything is just kind of like against the odds for, for our teaching artists. And so, so I, I, that's one of the things that I struggle a lot um, in trying to figure out what the right solution is. Um, and so. That, that would be something I would throw in. Great, thank you. Um, in a smaller city uh, like St. Louis, where I don't feel like we have quite as many supports in, in the way that New York City does for teaching artists, and it's certainly a conversation where we are right now, so I just want to second that. Um, yeah, please. Um, uh, just a quick one, and I'm not sure if this is going to be uh, good for everybody, but it's, it, looking forward, there's something that keeps coming up, especially in the last year, uh, we talked a little bit about this, but um, at, uh, we talked about trauma with kids uh, today, but I've come to understand after all of these years that every time we do a play that has any issue in it, it's no longer a question of there might be someone out there. They, there's always someone out there who's grappling with the same situation. So the question I guess that I have is, we, is, is in facilitating conversations, particularly in today's political environment, it's really easy to get yourself into some deep trouble quickly, whether you're a teaching artist who's responding or an artist from the stage who's responding, or whether you're the person who's attempting to facilitate. And I don't know if, there's, if that's worthy of further conversation and, and some uh, rules of thumb or form to move forward with that could make it safer for everybody. So you're talking about like talkbacks and education programming. The lens is education, because I think that what you're talking about Honestly, I keep hearing theater leaders at the conference over the last few years um, talking about how to communicate across the political divide with audiences. I say this and I get a laugh every time. If you're a blueberry city in a tomato state, <laughs> tomato soup state, you know, the blueberry and tomato soup, um, yeah. it's particularly challenging. But I think yeah. we're all feeling that. Um, yeah. But yeah, maybe it makes talkbacks and things much more complicated. Yeah. And I'll just add, um, I think you heard this uh, uh, when Courtney spoke, uh, Laura, but, um, and I will, I will share this hopefully, uh, Courtney's okay with that, but um, uh, we've had a very interesting response to An the Diary of Anna Frank when we did it at our, at our organization and um, uh, because there's a, a particular uh, part of the play where Anne is um, talking about her period and her becoming a young lady and her breasts and, um, and so we've had such an interesting reaction for some, some of the uh, more conservative communities in, in, the, in, in there. And, um, and it's just been mind blowing for us, I think, in certain ways, because um, unfortunately, I think that story is echoing a lot in our community today. Joe, let me actually say what happened. A and, teacher and her class yeah, left. They walked out. They walked yeah. out. Yeah, they walked out of the performance because of 30, because of 30 seconds. In um, Seattle. In Seattle, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what we're just It's a coming of age blow. story and they could not handle yeah. the- The 30 um, seconds. They can talk about, I, I don't know, the conversation that we got into yeah. with our members in Seattle was, people can handle all kinds of violence yeah. on stage, but yeah. talk about, yeah. you know, yeah. young girls but, coming But of just age. something like I wanted to throw in is like maybe that's something in terms of looking to the future what, what's the line and where do we find the balance of making sure that we empower our students with knowledge 
um, and, and that we're not censoring them or sugarcoating things when when they need to know. And this is the world that they're inhabiting from us. So just throwing that out there. Very, very quickly, Dyer Van Frank was a perfect example of what I was talking about as well, when a Holocaust denier who might not have said something two years ago got up and started to, to deny that any of this had ever occurred. And then, you, then, you ha then how do you proceed in that conversation? So. I missed that. What was that? Oh, I, I think going off of that. We have a Holocaust survivor there who essentially said that. And, and, I, and I will share with you. Well, and I, I think as we think about sort of like the current political climate and sort of the, the new openness of, of being willing to discuss things for various reasons, some good, some perhaps less so. I know sort of a big conversation that's been a part of the field for the past couple of seasons now especially has been these conversations around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I know a lot of uh, organizations sort of with their staff and their full-time staff or part-time staff have been sort of engaging in ongoing uh, professional development around those conversations. Uh, but I know something sort of that we're thinking about how to take that same level of rigor that sort of we're looking at on an organization-wide level and look at part-time or contracted teaching artists and ensure they're sort of having those same conversations. And also for those of us who have youth councils or work with young people, how we're ensuring those conversations around EDI uh, and those, uh, those vocabularies and those ideas are also being uh, sort of thoroughly introduced to that generation as well because, right, we want to ensure that these, these generations coming up are able to engage in those conversations and sort of be productive in, in, in those spaces and in the theaters uh, that we operate with. In. So, EDI conversations around both teaching artists and the young people we work with. Yes. And their caregivers. On a, on a different note, I would love to see a little bit more um, programming around how we support young people with disabilities and neurodiverse learners. Uh, I do. I have a quick one. I would love uh, the bit about talking about trauma and how that affects our work. Uh, technology and, and how we are going to have to evolve uh, the way we think as artists as more and more studies come out about how technology is affecting growth and development. Okay, so this, uh, this might not necessarily be a conversation for this room, but TCG overall. Um, I had an experience where uh, someone said, you know, we didn't have a women identified group last year because we had the Me Too Forum. And that women identified experience being all about oppression really sucks. And how we're addressing misogyny, I mean, you know, just by, uh, if I make the assumption about pronouns in this room, there are a lot of women in this room, and I think that's where education, uh, it's acceptable for women to be in this room. But when we head into the rest of the conference, uh, it looks very different. Who's leading organizations looks very, very different. And addressing the misogyny in our field, not just the harass, the sexual harassment, as that's the only issue we face, but actually addressing the misogyny and the hatred of feminine bodies and female identified people would be fabulous. I hear you. Um, were there more? Okay, because otherwise, I'm getting a junk call from Lithuania right now. I'm sorry. Um, so while, while um, Lori deals you do with have her, one more. her new I'm gonna, friend, I'm going to turn the microphone. Um, I'm not going to take that call. Lori, I'm going to I'm going to give my last comment oh, to my Lori, left. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, I just want to have Patty. a moment to say thank you to these amazing Absolutely. <laughs> thank you Johanny and Mickey and Rachel for leading us in such a thought-provoking and um, you know, I have to I, the, the word that is 
coming out of my mouth is joyful. And I have to say it's so incongruous, but what is joyful is this community. Yeah. And the support that we offer each other and the, the fact that we can t speak so authentically from our experience and have the snaps and the, um, and the, the, the me too, you too moments. And I think that, um, and so I think that there is, there is tremendous joy and strength in that. So at the close of a, of a heavy day, um, there is also a lot of joy. So I just wanna say that. So Absolutely. Back, back to you, Lori, with your call from Lithuania. You beat me to it because I was totally going to thank the panel. You all were amazing. You really brought it home. Um, it was, it's hard stuff to talk about, but um, you really helped us get there. So thank you all. I want to thank everybody who participated in the um, conversation in planning the day and in um, executing each of these, I probably shouldn't use that word, in um, seeing all of these sessions and conversations come to life, um, starting with, where did Evelyn go? Thank you for this morning. Thank you for our, our group talking about inclusion and empowerment of youth voices. The trauma-informed care workshop was amazing. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate Sean and Matt coming from um, Starkweather and Shepley. They were very, very helpful resources. And of course, the safety of youth in our theaters. Thank you to our final plenary panel. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Young Arts. This has been an amazing space. It got a little dim this afternoon, but it's really gorgeous, isn't it? So thanks to Young Arts for their hospitality. Um, I will say that Audience Revolution um, funding uh, supported this day in terms of mostly our plenary panel, but in supporting our ability to bring some other speakers to this day. So thank you to Aud Rev and the Dars Duke Charitable Foundation. Um, I th think I've thanked the pre-conference planning committee, the space. Lori, oh, Lori, goodness. I, I think thank you. Is... I'd like to thank HowlRound for making it possible. <laughs> totally wonderful that we could share this day with people beyond the room. So thank you to HowlRound. Thank to all of you for being here together. You made it great. Um, I want to say one other thing, and then I'll ask for Kati. Um, there was another um, pre-conference day uh, serving folks from the higher ed world um, in a different space. They are anxious to meet you all and so back at the hotel over drinks they will be looking for you. Please look for them. They would like to make some connections, so I urge that. So please, yes, Kati. I just wanted to say thank you to you, Lori okay. Baskin. <laughs> We are hard cats to wrangle, so thank you for being our wrangler. Just getting us all here is, is, a, is a feat, you know. Well, thank you and all of your organizations that made it possible for you to be here, and it's been a great day. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of the week.